Good morning, this is Pauline. And this is Madeline. And we start with the Site for White news for Friday the 6th of March. Tuesday, 10th of March, the strollers will be meeting for a stroll in Shanklin. They will meet for co coffee at Brown Riggs Farm Shop at approximately 10.45am. After the stroll, lunch will be at the Crab Inn at 12 noon. Please contact Laura on 522205 or you can email members at iwsb.org.uk if you'd like to join the strollers group. The swimming group are swimming at the waterside pool in Ride from 8pm till 8.45pm. The pool is closed to the public whilst the group swims. There are male and female volunteers to help you get in and out of the pool, as well as lifeguards to ensure your safety. To join the swimming group, again, please call Sight for White first to notify us of your swimming ability. You need to register with the office at Millbrook House first to be able to swim with the group. Wednesday the 11th of March, the weekly coffee morning will be held at Millbrook House from 10am till 11.30am. This week, Richard Til Tildesley, General Manager at Southern Vectors, will be joining us to speak to us about the Southern Vectors service and to answer any questions members may have. There will also be our low vision drop-in between 10 and 11.30 a.m. This is a weekly event to allow you to view and try the low vision equipment we have at Sight for White without the need for an appointment. The book group will be meeting at Lord Louis Library between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. We discuss the last month's book over tea and coffee and hand out the book for the next month. The books are available on CD or USB. Please contact Laura Jasper on 52205 for more information or email members at iwsb.org.uk. Thursday, 12th of March, Sue will be at Our Space, the community drop-in at the Town Hall in East Cowes. Come along to say hello between 12 noon and 2 p.m. and enjoy a free cup of tea, coffee or soup. The Thursday social group are meeting at Millbrook House. The group meets from 10.30am till 2pm. Most Thursdays, with the help of volunteers, the group enjoy a number of activities, crosswords, catch catching up on news and trivia, knitting and crochet. They're currently making pom-poms for a rug and will be starting on Easter decoration. This very friendly mixed group also love to chat and enjoy lunch together. Later in the afternoon, volunteers come in and read to the group on different topic topics. If you'd like to join the group, then again, please contact us on 52205. Any other news? Dress for Less is looking for an assistant manager. Saturdays only, at six and a half hours a week, at £8.72 per hour at our Dress Agency boutique in St James's Street, Newport. Dress for Less is a 50-50 dress agency and boutique specialising in high-end ladies' fashion and occasion wear. Do you have the passion and personality to lead our team of Saturday volunteers? Your hard work and dedication will directly help the people Sight for White, Isle of Wight Society for the Blind was established to support every day. For an informal chat prior to applying, please contact Retail Manager Debbie at Dress for Less, St James's Street, that's on Newport, 01983 523 197. Job description and application forms are available from our website, www.iwsb.org.uk or from the boutique. Please note CVs will not be accepted. Post or email applications to Miriam Tong, CEO, Site for White, Millbrook House, 137 Carisbrook Road, Newport, Isle of Wight, PO301 DD, or CEO at iwsb.org.uk. The closing date is the 16th of March 2020 and interviews the afternoon of Saturday the 21st of March. Oxite produces patented 
smart glasses that address visual impairments and will be at Landguard Manor, Landguard Manor Road, Shanklin, Isle of Wight, PO 37 7JB, on Monday the 9th of March, from 12pm to 4pm, and on Tuesday the 10th of March, from 9am until 4pm. They say, do you have tunnel vision? Then come and see us. Yes, actually come and see us. We understand everyone's eye condition is different, but if our glasses suit your eyes, then the experience will be, well, an eye-opener. With Oxite glasses, you'll be able to see much more of the world around you, so you can enjoy social situations, exhibitions, read books, watch cinema and TV. If we can see you, we'll help you to see us. The event is free, so call 01865 580 255 or email care at oxide.co.uk to book a demonstration. Sight for White is holding a low vision exhibition at New Close Cricket Ground, Blackwater Road, Newport on Saturday the 21st of March, 10.30am till 2.30pm. This is a free event with a large car park, disabled access and facilities and refreshments available to purchase from the bar. Join us to meet with exhibitors and support services including Laura Cooljar, St Mary's ECLO, Associated Optical, Dolphin Speech Software, Humanware, the Macula Society, Optilec, Professional Vision Services, Sight and Sound Technology, the Sensory Support Team and the Windermere Manor Hotels. We will also be joined by Terry from the NI, sorry, RNIB Tech Squad. He will be able to answer your tech related questions, help set up your own devices and will be demonstrating the Amazon Alexa speech recognition devices. Southern Vectis routes 2 and 3 stop just outside the venue. However, as the road is a busy main road, we're offering a shuttle mini bus service to and from Newport bus station. This will run at set times throughout the day. Please ring 52205 for more information and to book a space. New £20 note. The new £20 note entered circulation on the 20th of February. The new note is the same size and has similar colours to the paper note. It also has the tactile feature, feature which is created by a series of raised dots as do the new £10 and £5 notes. The tactile dots are in the top left hand corner. The £20 note has three dots, the £10 note has two dots and the £5 note doesn't have any dots. Coronavirus. Whilst there, there have been no cases of the coronavirus identified on the Isle of Wight at present, with the steady spread of the coronavirus infection across Europe, and with a number of isolated reports in the UK involving those who have recently travelled to places where cases have been confirmed, it seems timely to refer to the NHS and Public Health England advice on how to limit the spread, not just of the coronavirus, but common flu viruses and the common cold. Like the common cold and flu, Coronavirus infection usually occurs through a close contact with an infected person via coughs and sneezes or hand contact. A person can also be infected by touching contaminated surfaces if they do not wash their hands. The risk of being in close contact with a person with coronavirus or contaminated surfaces is very low at the current time with those suspected of carrying the virus being kept in isolation. However, to protect yourself and others from the common cold, flu or coronavirus, you are advised to always carry tissues with you and use them to catch your cough or sneeze. Then bin the tissue and wash your hands or use a sanitizer gel. Wash your hands often with soap and water especially after using public transport. Use a sanitizer gel if soap and water are not available. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth with unwashed hands. 
avoid close contact with people who are unwell. Therefore, it would be appreciated that if you are feeling unwell, could you please refrain, refrain from attending Site for White activities until you are recovered. This is to ensure the health of all our members, volunteers and staff. You can find the latest information and advice from Public Health England at www.gov.uk slash coronavirus. Pre-owned equipment for sale. We have been asked to advertise on behalf of a member a pre-loved Braille Pen 12 Touch. This is a Bluetooth Braille keyboard with Braille display designed for use by individuals who are blind or have low vision. This quick keyboard connects to a phone, netbook, PC or tablet. It allows the user to navigate an external device with a joystick, write SMS, browse the internet, complete six key entry into a braille translator or simply type. The user can also switch between six dot and eight dot braille entries. The asking price is £100. If you are interested in purchasing this item or require more information, please call 5222 and ask for Laura. Accessible Activities and Services Day will be held at West White Sports and Community Centre on Saturday, March the 14th. That's from 10.30am to 3.30pm. All welcome, admission free of charge. For further details, phone 01983 752 or you can email info at westwhite .org.uk. This week's In Touch, blind stand-up comedy, accessible apps and a study about touch. A new study about touch, what you can do about inaccessible apps and blind comedian David Eagle. Radio 4's All in the Mind programme is running a big survey on how we feel about touch. Peter White talks to the presenter, Claudia Hammond, about why they especially welcome contributions for blind listeners. We explore what to do when you find an app that isn't accessible and interview the blind comedian, David Eagle, who's just been named Best Newcomer in the influential Chortle Awards. Now moving on to the County Press for Friday, March the 6th. And there's just one headline. We're on alert. Organisations on the Isle of Wight have been revealing how they are ready to respond to coronavirus. The Isle of Wight Council and Visit IW are among those who have issued advice in a week that saw Hampshire record its first case of the virus that is also known as COVID-19. An Isle of Wight Council spokesperson said, it is important to remember that for the vast majority of people, the symptoms will be relatively mild. Should there be a positive test result on the island, experts at Public Health England will help reduce any transmission of infection by tracing any people that have been in contact with that individual. The best thing that local people can do to protect themselves and other people is to wash their hands with soap and water regularly. Pledging to continue its work to encourage local tourism, Visit Isle of Wight is urging residents and visitors to follow official guidelines. Will Miles, Managing Director, said, Our message to residents, island businesses and our visitors is to follow the guidelines laid down by the World Health Organisation Public Health England and the Home Office. Visit Isle of Wight is in continuous contact with Visit England, Visit Britain and UK inbound to get the latest updates and advice. By working together we hope the Isle of Wight can play its part in limiting the impact that Covid-19 has on a global scale. Tourism is a major contributor to the island's economy and as such, it is in everyone's interests to work together to lessen any impact the coronavirus can have here. The Isle of Wight NHS Trust has set up a medical pod in a standalone building isolated from the rest of St Mary's Hospital. Only islanders told to go there by the NHS non-emergency number 111 should attend. 
According to the government's chief medical officer, an epidemic is now likely and workers who are self-isolating will now receive sick pay from day one. The West White Sports and Community Centre in Freshwater says it has invested in more hand cleansing stations and is reminding staff and volunteers to wash their hands regularly. Isle of Wight travel operators, White Link, Red Funnel and Southern Vectis have all issued statements. A spokesperson for Hover, Tra Hover Travel said, We continue to monitor this matter for the safety of our customers and staff and will adhere to any instructions that may be issued from the governing bodies. When is first class post not first class? A large number of post boxes on the island are not now be, being emptied after 9am and even earlier on Saturday, Royal Mail has revealed. The postal firm argues fewer letters are being sent and usage in certain areas has dropped. It was not able to tell the county press how many post boxes on the island would be affected by the change. It says the overall number of letters has fallen by 50% since 2004. On March 23rd, the price of a first-class stamp will rise by 6p to 76p. A second-class stamp will cost 65p, up 4p. A spokesperson said Royal Mail is introducing more collections on delivery on the Isle of Wight. This means more postmen and postwomen will collect mail from post boxes while they're doing their daily round. Since 2014, postmen and women have been collecting mail from some post boxes while on their rounds. More than half of Royal Mail post boxes now have mail collected by delivery colleagues. County Press reader Malcolm Watson has already noticed the change on the post box at the junction of Simeon and Moncton Streets in Ryde. A sign warns customers that while the last collection there will be at 9am during the week, Saturday's last collection will be at 7am. Mr Watson is urging concerned islanders to contact Royal Mail and wrote, we now need to post our mail the day before it is collected, while paying more for it. Perhaps the collection will be restored if enough of us make a fuss. Captain Loses Tribunal The captain of a red funnel car ferry involved in a collision with a pleasure boat has lost his case to get his job back. Ian Drummond, 63, was in charge when the ferry collided with a 32-foot motor cruiser in the Solent in 2018. He was cleared of committing two maritime offences and claimed he was wrongly dismissed. The BBC reported a judge ruled he was not sacked unfairly but should have been paid his notice. During an employment tribunal, Judge James Dawson said Mr Drummond, who was dismissed from his job following the crash, should have been paid for his six weeks notice period, which amounted to almost £6,500. Captain Fran Collins, Red Funnel Chief Executive, told the tribunal Mr Drummond was dismissed for breaching health and safety rules. She said he had stayed in his lookout seat rather than moving around the bridge looking for obstacles. He was cleared in December by Southampton magistrates of failing to keep a lookout and misconduct, misconduct likely to endanger ships, structures or individuals. Plans to extend the Isle of Wight's train network from Wootton to Newport and from Shanklin to Ventnor could be on the track after the island's MP submitted a formal expression of interest to the Department for Transport, the DFT. Bob Seeley is seeking a feasibility study that would require further funding, funding from the DFT, arguing an extended network would bring significant gains for the island. Before 1966, the Isle of Wight boasted more than 55 miles of railway line. Restoring that network would require a number of organisations working together, including the Isle of Wight Steam Railway between Wootton and Smallbrook Junction. The Haven Street based charity and tourist attraction says it has no plans to extend its line to complete the proposed route between Ryde and the island's county town. However, it has noted with interest the suggestion by Mr Seeley with the support of the Isle of Wight Council. The Solent Local Enterprise Partnership has already part funded a plan to modernise Island Line as previously reported. The partnership is backing this latest idea and told the county press 
The Solent LEP has recently contributed £700,000 to complement the DFT's £26 million investment to safeguard the island line, and we're fully supportive of proposals to reopen former railway alignments that have the potential to ensure the recent investment is optimised further. According to the DFT, the Transport Secretary has invited MPs, local authorities and community groups across England to come forward with proposals on how they could reinstate ACT local services. A £500 million fund is being put in place. The, the DFT says it has already received a large number of expressions of interest. Mr Seeley says discussions will take place over the next two months. Leap Year Baby News Maternity staff at St Mary's Hospital welcomed two Leap Year babies. First to arrive at 12.20pm and weighing six pounds was Harrison Irwin, a son for Kelly Rimmer and Chris Irwin of East Cows. The second baby was Lily May Downing, a daughter for Ellen Phelps and John Downing of Ride. Lily May arrived at 7.24pm weighing five pounds 11 ounces. Amanda Pearson, head of midwifery at St Mary's Hospital said, Congratulations to both sets of parents on their new arrivals. A baby born on February the 29th is indeed a special event and the whole team wished the babies health and happiness for the future. The babies will celebrate in style every four years but will no doubt choose a day on which to have an annual birthday. Boris's island deal money not imminent. The leader of the Isle of Wight Council has warned Islanders not to expect millions of pounds in extra government cash to be included in next week's budget. However, Councillor Dave Stewart has insisted the Prime Minister remains supportive of the long-awaited island deal. The Council said Boris Johnson has again given assurances that he is committed to providing extra financial support to recognise the Isle of Wight's remote location and its increased spending requirements. The proposed deal aims to put the Isle of Wight on the same footing as other British islands. Boris Johnson met a delegation of Isle of Wight councillors at the Conservative Councillors Association Conference in Hinkley, Leicestershire last weekend. The council leader said the PM was supportive, but Mr Stewart admitted to the county press the money was not imminent. He said Boris Johnson is very aware of our focus on the island deal. He's also referred us to Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. I'm not expecting an announcement in the budget. In October, Ireland MP Bob Seeley wrote to Mr Johnson asking for millions of pounds for public services. During the Queen's speech debate, Mr Seeley told parliamentary colleagues the Isle of Wight has to all intents and purposes been treated as part of the mainland of the United Kingdom because we have never had additional support despite the additional costs. The Prime Minister has been generous enough to agree the need for an island settlement. He's done so on visits to the island in June, on record in the House of, on September the 25th, and in private conversations with me. This week, Councillor Stewart told the county press he believed the snap general election had held up matters, but he was hopeful there would be more detailed news in the government's autumn financial statement. Hard work pays off for Wessex Cancer Trust. It took a year and a lot of hard graft, but it was all worth it when the Wessex Cancer Trust's Isle of Wight Cancer Wellbeing Centre was officially opened this week. Mark King of Level 42 cut the ribbon to open the centre, which cost £100,000 to refurbish. Mark made a substantial donation himself. Therapy rooms, a meeting area and a counselling area are among the facilities to help cancer patients. The Trust helps people with services including yoga, massage, reiki, crafts and a choir. The building's decoration is restful with artwork by Isle of Wight College and Christ the King College students. Mike Sizer Green, Trust Isle of Wight office manager said, I was a serving police officer when cancer came knocking at my door and the Daisy bus service became so important to me. The illness changed my life and I am pleased to have seen through this project to give the island a better service than ever before. Lorraine White, fundraising manager said, 
Around a thousand people used the centre last year and 20,000 islanders used the daisy bus, so it shows how vital we are. Nearly a tenth of Year 6 pupils did not get the first choice of secondary school that they wanted, with two schools oversubscribed. Families found out this week whether their child would move up to the school they requested. For 89.5% of families it was good news as their child was allocated to attend their first choice of secondary school. However, more than 250 pupils did not get their first choice of school and were placed in either their second or third choice and 2.5% of pupils were not successful with their preferences. Figures released by the Isle of Wight Council show 12 children had to accept their third choice. Two schools, Carisbrook College and the Island Free School, were oversubscribed in their first choice of preferences. The Island Free School received more than 80 extra applications than they could take. 202 pupils put the school as their first choice, but only 125 were offered a place. All those who put Christ the King College, the Bay CE Academy and Medina College as first choice were offered a place. Three schools lowered the number of pupils they would accept, compared to last year, by at least 30 pupils in each establishment. Four island schools filled their allocated number of spaces for the September 2020 intake, Carisbrook, Cowes, Ride and the Bay. Christ the King has nearly 50 empty spaces, even though it saw a rise in the number of applications. The biggest island secondary school, Ride Academy, allocated places to 97% of pupils who listed it as first choice. Most of the 43 pupils who did not apply for a place at secondary school were allocated to Medina. An Isle of Wight Council spokesperson said, all children are offered a place. If parents' preferences could not be met, including when only one preference was named, then they were allocated a place for their child at the nearest school with places available. Those who made an application after the closing date were allocated a place at their preferred school if a place was available. Costa for St Mary's as Friends Cafe moves. An army of volunteers has helped relocate the shop and cafe run by Friends of St Mary's Hospital. The group had to move out of its prominent foyer site after the hospital invited a commercial undertaking to run a coffee shop there. Costa Coffee confirmed this week it was moving in later this month. The friends are still offering service with a smile in their new locations. They have retained a corner shop in the foyer area and the cafe has been relocated to the northern section of the hospital next to outpatients. Shop and cafe manager Lisa Brody said, it is gratifying that throughout these big changes we have enjoyed so much support from customers, patients and staff. A spokesperson for Costa said, We're excited to confirm the opening of a brand new store in the hospital. We are looking forward to being an active part of the local community. Brothers Jaser and Jack Wilkie have been jailed for a combined total of 21 years for offences in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Jaser Sam Wilkie, 31, of Pallance Road Northwood, was charged alongside his brother Jack Dillon Wilkie, 28, of No Fixed Abode, for an aggravated burglary in Newport and a robbery in Lymington. The circumstances were that on August the 29th, 2019, the pair forced entry to an address in Westminster Lane, Newport, and threatened the occupants with knives. Nothing was stolen during the incident. At around 7.38am on September the 1st, 2019, the pair flagged down a Renault Clio on School Lane, Lymington. The driver, a man in his 30s, was assaulted by both defendants who then stole his car. They were stopped and arrested by police a short time later before being charged with robbery. robbery. Initially, both men denied the burglary, but on February the 25th, the first day of their trial, they pleaded guilty at the Isle of Wight Crown Court. Both had pleaded guilty to the robbery at an earlier Isle of Wight Magistrates Court hearing. They were sentenced on Wednesday to nine and a half years each for the burglaries and an additional 12 months each for the robbery. Head teacher speaks of special needs struggle. A head teacher has spoken of the struggle of catering for special educational needs and disabilities, SEND. D, children in mainstream schools following an Ofsted inspection. 
Executive Head Teacher of Oakfield CE Primary, Colin Haley, said, The SEND provision across the island, not just Oakfield, is a challenge after inspectors found the school's curriculum was not consistently well planned for SEND pupils and they did not do as well as they could. Inspectors also said leaders had not ensured staff have the expertise they need and recommended staff to be given suitable training. Mr Haley said mainstream island schools are having to cope with pupils who would benefit from specialist provision or additional support within their education setting. The inspectors witnessed us working with a number of high needs pupils and they saw that the mainstream setting and the associated training levels of staff does not provide as well as a specialist setting would for these individuals. Oakfield is a very caring, nurturing school rising to that challenge and doing amazingly well with a number of children with very complex needs. We are not the only school having to cope with that scenario on the island and under the circumstances Oakfield is very much a success story. Can we do better? Yes we can and the Oakfield staff are hugely enthusiastic, determined and professionally focused to do so. The school, part of the Ariton and Oakfield Federation, was rated requires improvement again but was found to be caring where staff go out of their way to nurture pupils. It was rated good for behaviour and attitude of pupils, personal development and early years provision, but requires improvement in the quality of education provided and leadership and management. Mr Haley said the inspection highlighted the very clear progress the school had made. He said, Staff and pupils have worked extremely hard and the inspectors recognise the strengths in the school, particularly our Christian ethos, wide community links and strong pupil progress in early years. A public right of way over the cliff top at Shanklin's Hope Road was closed following a large cliff fall on Sunday afternoon. Dirt and debris tumbled onto the path and road below. Police, Ventnor and Benbridge Coast Guard rescue teams and the Isle of Wight Council were called to the area at 2.40pm. The cliff top path near the Longstay car park on Hope Road was closed with pedestrian only access to the revetment. The local authority said it was monitoring the cliff. The sun may have come out later in the week but the beach huts in Sandown aren't quite ready for summer. It'll be difficult for the owners to get into their huts. Police chase drink driver across field. A drink driver has been given a five-year driving ban after being arrested twice within a week and police had to chase her through a field to catch her. Valerie Susan Burnett, 42, pleaded guilty to failing to provide a specimen and driving while over the legal alcohol limit at the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court. The court heard Burnett of Farrier's Way Shorewell was first arrested on January the 18th when she crashed her car in Bryston. Prosecutor Anne Smout explained, police were called to an incident where Miss Burnett had crashed her car into a wall. When officers arrived they were informed by a member of public they had taken Miss Burnett's keys away and she had run from the vehicle and was hiding in a nearby field. Police saw her standing in the field but she started breaking into a run. As she ran, she was able to climb over a fence and away from officers before reaching a second fence, a barbed wire fence, where they were able to catch up with her and grab her by the ankle. She wasn't asked for a roadside sample as she was evidently too drunk. Officers took her to the police station where she repeatedly failed to produce an alcohol reading. Five days later, on January the 23rd, at around noon, police on Farrier's Way in Shorewell were following a car they were told had been in an accident earlier in the day. When police spoke to Miss Burnett, she was very obstructive and was again arrested and taken to the police station, where this time she blew an alcohol reading of 82, 
The legal limit is 35. Burnett's defence, Liz Miller, said, in relation to the first incident, she actually left her keys in the car and walked away from the vehicle before the member of public took them. She has been working as a personal assistant and she has been helping her parents run their farm. Burnett was disqualified from driving for five years and given a 12-month custodial sentence, suspended for 18 months. She must pay court costs of £85 and a surcharge of £122. A Ride Academy student has been granted a place at a prestigious ballet school. Ben Thompson, 16, will train at the School of Ballet Theatre UK and will start his degree in 2021 upon completion of his A-levels. Ben was initially reluctant to try dance lessons, but after stepping out of his comfort zone, he's now secured one of only 16 places. His interest in dance blossomed in year seven when he began to study jazz dance within musicals. It wasn't long before his enthusiasm and engagement caught the attention of Ride Academy's dance teacher and head of PE, Hilary Seaton. He's since amassed a collection of accolades, including winning Child Performer of the Year at the Child of White Awards, performing behind pop star Louisa Johnson at Wembley Stadium, winning Ireland's Got Talent and perform performing at Bestival. Mrs Seaton contacted the Artistic Director of Ballet Theatre UK and Ben was asked to audition. She said, we are so unbelievably proud of Ben. It shows how hard work is the key to success. Little Lego Inventors. More than 100 students from across the Isle of Wight took part in a school day with a difference, building Lego inventions. Pupils met at Rise School for the Boomtown Build Lego Expo, an event aimed at getting children thinking about building and engineering. Participating schools included Medina House, Honey Hill Primary, Gurnard Primary, Knighton Primary, Priory School, Gatton and Lake Primary, Braiding Primary, St Helens Primary and St Saviour's RC Primary as well as Ride School. Stephen Shaw, a Lego Education Academy trainer said, we celebrated the hard work of more than 75 primary age children from a range of schools on the island. This was a fabulous opportunity to see firsthand their developing skills and understanding of the world of STEM, that's science, technology, engineering and maths. We've had amazing support from the Isle of Wight Construction Training Group and the Isle of Wight Construction Safety Group as this year's theme was construction and the built environment. A pub in Freshwater has been given a one-star food hygiene review after inspectors found the same problems they did two years ago. Environmental officers from the Isle of Wight Council inspected the Vine Inn in Freshwater, one of Fuller's pubs on the island, in January 2018 and when they returned two years later in 2020, inspectors said it was disappointing to note the same problems were found. The pub on School Green Road was also found to have an issue with stock rotation. Numerous sources had a use-by date of September 2019, raw gammon steaks had started to oxidise and coleslaw, chicken curry and cooked rice had, had to be used at least four days before the inspection. A system of stock rotation had been put in place but it had not been adhered to. In the freezer there are a number of uncovered raw burgers stored directly on the shelf which may have led to contamination. The general standard of hygiene was judged to be fair, but food debris was found in the metal shelving beneath the preparation surfaces which stored the clean crockery. The seals to the fridge and freezers had food in them and the microwave oven was dirty. At the time of the visit, the food premises registration had not been completed or submitted. Anyone who supplies food regularly must register their business at least 28 days before they open. Inspectors also found floor covering was torn and acting as a trap for dirt and food. A spokesperson for Fuller said, While we are always disappointed with the low food scores, our tenants have already addressed the issues raised. The local authority will be re-attending shortly and we hope the pub will get an early reassessment. <coughs> St Mary's pupils help Aussie namesakes. 
Pupils and staff at St Mary's Catholic School in Ryde raised more than £400 for its namesake primary school down under in Moriah, New South Wales. Children and staff dressed in Australian themed clothes, dusting off or creating kangaroo, koala, cricketers and surfer outfits and were entertained by Dame Edna and Kylie Minogue for the day. The staff took part in bush tucker trial style competitions. Head teacher Alison Langridge said, we wanted to contribute towards the relief fund to support people who have been affected by the terrible fires in Australia. Through the diocese we made contact with a Catholic school in Moriah with the same name as ours and from talking to the principal there we knew that many families in the school had been affected by the fires. We raised an amazing £460. The Isle of Wight Council made more than £100,000 last year from finding parents and carers whose children had unauthorised absences. Despite the number of truancy penalty notices TPN issued dropping, more people have failed to pay them, resulting in legal action being taken. In 2018-19, 97 cases were sent to court because parents and carers failed to pay the £120 fine in 28 days. A Freedom of Information request by the Knowledge Academy found the council received £105,420 from fines paid before and after the 28 days. In 2017-18, 2030 TPNs were given to parents and carers of students compared to 1,920 in 2018-19. Fines for a child skipping school without authorisation start at £60 if paid within 21 days, but rise if they're not paid within 28 days or longer and parents are threatened with a £1,000 fine in court. Funds for <coughs> Eating Disorder Group A trust which helps people with eating disorders has been awarded almost £10,000 from the National Lottery Awards for All. Kay's Trust was established by the mother of Kay Lee Barnes, who died at 29 after a prolonged battle with anorexia nervosa. It has now been given a start-up grant of £9,760. Chair and founder Sue Barnes said, The organisation was set up to help the families, carers and friends of people with eat an eating disorder to come together and know they are not alone. Support from people who have had similar experiences is so important and was not available for me. The Trust currently runs fortnightly support group meetings on Friday mornings in Ride. The funding will allow us to expand to meet in Newport and, get, and help get our message out to health service professionals. Go to kaestrust.org for further information. And that's all we have time for today. So it's goodbye from Madeline. And goodbye from Pauline. Hello. This is Sonara. And this is Imelda, reading today's letters. And the first comes from Mike Stark of Chale Green, and it's called Maggie's Child. Defection to the Labour Party would to be, uh, seem to be on the cards for our MP Bob Seeley. If his latest jottings in the county press on the 28th of February are to be believed... For Captain Bob appears to have espoused the socialist policy of renationalisation of cross channel ferries by suggesting on Isle of Wight Council buyout. Surely his Tory party leadership will not look favourably on his ambitions for parliamentary advancement if he pursues this strategy in defiance of the party's preoccupation with privatisation. Indeed, he risks offending the ghost of Margaret Thatcher, who steered what is now White Link onto its downward course in 1984 by flogging off this public asset for 66 million to sea containers. 
but the financiers who cream off the profits from our faltering cross-solent services can rest easy. Bob's scheme for his proposed buyout could only be uh, succeed if his long-promised cash boost from the government to County Hall's coffers take place. I respectfully suggest, on health and safety grounds, that neither he nor we should hold our breath waiting for that one. And uh, on to this next one. Uh, I can't announce a name because that seems to be cut off. We're planning for the future. Following the challenge of setting a lawful and balanced budget for the island again in February, I'm pleased this necessary process has been completed and we can now move forward as a council. As most householders will know, Planting your budget and keeping to it can certainly be a challenge. And as we at the Council are dealing with public money, we know that pr this process carries that additional responsibility. But budgets are also an opportunity to prioritise what you can do and plan for the future. This year we will be developing our Digital Innovation Centre at Cowes, opening our multi-million pound recycling centre at Newport and delivering our extra care facilities at Ryde. With new school buildings opening across the island and with the island line improvements all funded and ready to start, we really do have some great infrastructure projects ahead of us. The arrival of the Tour of Britain in 2021 will be something I hope all the island can engage with and enjoy, including young cycling enthusiasts. I am attending meetings with public health on coronavirus and I can reassure our residents that we have all necessary plans and arrangements in place. Van information, and this is from Rob Medway of God's Hill. My son visited the mainland over the weekend, leaving his van parked in the back streets of Ryde and travelling by hovercraft. On his return, he was horrified to find his van was no longer around, and having checked it had not been towed away, he called me to drive him to Ride Police Station, where the sign on the door read, Unmanned, call 121. We waited 20 minutes in the phone queue, until a pleasant lady carefully took in all the details. We didn't end the conversation with much optimism. I remembered all the car ferries now have number recognition systems and I rang them both, but their response was that due to data protection they could only respond to police requests. Two days later we had a call from community police officers in Ryde telling us they had located the vehicle. We raced over to find the vehicle neatly parked a few streets away and completely undamaged. We let ourselves in to find all the valuable power tools were missing, but everything else was intact. Firstly, I should like to thank the police for their work on our behalf and the pleasant efficient way the deal with they dealt with us. Secondly, we should like to better protect and defend our vehicle and we have ordered a tracker which I understand are now much cheaper than when they first came out. I appeal to your readers for any further advice as to how the thieves managed to get into the grey Mercedes Vito without a key or damaging the vehicle. Thirdly, we should like to offer a £100 reward for any further information leading to the capture of these thieves. Our investigations suggest that our problem is not unique, but rather a bit of a blight in this section of town. My son's van and the tools collection inside have been built up over many years and represent his work and livelihood 
and like all these crimes, leaves a terrible personal and mental scar. The law-abiding majority need to stand shoulder to shoulder for the good of all to catch these blighters and ensure they do not re-offend. We had some vandalism in our orchard a few years ago, and again I offered a small reward, and on that occasion we were successful in finding who was responsible. I am optimistic on this occasion as well with the support of the county press. Harbour Harmony, and this one from Paul Knocker in Bembridge. Bembridge Harbour Trust, BHT, was formed in 2007 to buy the harbour, an unlikely dream to make it a community project. Not surprisingly, they were outbid, but according to their website, they committed fully to support the incumbent, the new owners, in any action perceived to be for the good of the harbour. This they have failed to do. The delays and, and the huge cost resulting from their constant interference has set back the original regeneration plans by at least four years. BHT's most recent campaign campaign, supported by posters, flags, t-shirts and social media postings, comes under the heading, Show Us the Books. The trustees must surely understand the owner's legal ob obligations in respect of the Harbour Act and those which apply to private limited companies. This campaign serves no purpose and is just adding to the confusion and conflict. Bookings were down last year, and so are the reservations for this year, particularly the rally business, which will have serious consequences for local businesses and clubs. The problems were neatly summoned up by a yacht owner who used to be a regular visitor. Look at the social media postings for Yarmouth, where everyone is working together in harmony, and compare this to Bembridge, where there's a war going on, and we will not be coming back. The blame for the time and money wasted over the past four years rests with the BHT obstruction strategy. Time to move on and get everyone on side to secure the future of this important asset for the island. And now we move on to Brian Greening's White Memories, Not Today, The Sea Shall Not Have Them. I am sure, like me, readers are often shocked to read of the death of an old friend or colleague when they pick up the county press. This has been the case for ages, and none more so than during the Second World War. Old school pals and workmates were sent across the world, and some were never seen alive again. With the onset of VE Day in May, it seems a good time to remember once again those who experienced those times. Friends of first-class stoker Ernie Hiscock must have been shocked to read in the county press a report that he had lost his life while on board the HMS Express, a mine-laying destroyer that had previously rescued many from the beaches of Dunkirk. For he was a Newport man who had a wife and eight children. There was a real fear during the war that the Germans would at some time occupy the Isle of Wight. Canada was considered to be safe haven at the time, and children throughout the country were placed on liners and sent on their way. In 1940, among those sent to Canada would be 12 children from the Isle of Wight. They were named as 13-year-old Valerie Butcher of East Coast, Patricia Howe of Freshwater, Jacqueline 
Derek and Wendy Brown of Totland, Hazel, Basil, Margaret and Eileen Cole of Colwell Bay, Cecil Hayden of God's Hill, John Roberts of Wooten, and Naomi Guy of Albert Street, Newport. However, en route, their ship was torpedoed off Scotland. Fortunately, all the island children made it to a lifeboat and were picked up by a tanker and eventually landed in Scotland. And there they were escorted back to the Isle of Wight and all enjoyed a happy reunion with their parents at Newport Railway Station. That is not exactly true, for when Mr Roberts sought to find his son, he was nowhere to be found. The mystery was solved when the other children informed his father that young John had gone off the train at Wooten, where his family home was. All's well that ends well. This too was to be the case with the aforementioned Ernie Hiscock. Two months after his wife had been informed of his death, she received a postcard from him stating he was alive and well and being held in Germany. He said, I'm quite well, not wounded and am being well treated. I shall be evacuated from here in a few days' time to another camp and shall be able to write to you from there. Heartiest greetings. M. Apparently, when his ship was hit by a mine, it was assumed all the men missing had perished at sea. Ernie must have had a lucky rabbit's foot in his pocket, for somehow he had managed to get on board a life raft where he survived for four days before being picked up by a German sub submarine. They took him to Italy and marched him all the way to Poland where he spent the rest of the war as a prisoner working on a nearby farm. On that ill-fated march to Poland, Ernie recalled that many men had died. When his wife received her husband's postcard, she was naturally overjoyed, but had one concern. She had been paid her husband's insurance money and had naturally spent it all on clothes for her eight children. Would she be asked to pay it back, she acquired, when speaking to a county press reporter. And thankfully, history tells us that she was not. Ernie Hiscock was not a young man when he was called up. He was in his late thirties, and one of his first ships was the HMS Hood, that was sunk with the loss of more than 14,000 lives and just three survivors in May 1941. Thankfully by then, Ernie had been transferred to HMS Express, though some might think that it was a case of out of the frying pan into the fire, for she hit an enemy mine and 58 men were reported to have lost their lives although eight were later picked up. We do not know whether Ernie was included in this number. When he returned to civilian life, the local council gave him back his old job as a steam roller driver, and as he, as he lived in Barton Road, he often frequented the Princess Royal Public House in Cross Lane. Once he'd had a few drinks, he would sometimes take out his death certificate and show those assembled. He would also have been able to tell them that he had had a memorial service held for him in St Paul's Church. Only two of Ernie's children are still alive, Sally and his son, who is better known affectionately as Herbie, despite being christened Raymond, who recalls the day he ran down Barton Road to meet his father when he returned home. There was more good news for islanders when new churchman Arthur Sibbick arrived home just as his mother was serving Monday dinner after his parents had been informed he had lost his life when HMS Jersey sank. 
With the end of the war, there were naturally great celebrations and street parties for the children. I've seen photographs of them locally that include those held in roads across the town in Albert Street, Worsley Road, Clifford Street and Southview near Nine Acres. It's hard to imagine the sheer joy and relief that residents experienced and we must pray that such a thing never happens again. My generation, those born after 1941, can recall little of those war years. We grew up knowing little of taking refuge under the stairs, enjoyed a good standard educa of education, and when we left school, we had little trouble obtaining employment. Indeed, many of us went through our entire working lives and never experienced being out of a job. In many cases, we were later able to purchase our own home, and on a lighter note, we grew up in a period that produced music that has stood the test of time. Sadly, today, many leave schools with excellent qualifications, only to find good jobs few and far between, and they will not be guaranteed a job for life. As for buying their own home, this for many will never happen. As for today's music, come back Frankie Lane. <laughs> and now we move on to my view. Matt Chatfield, shame the great wall of ride is not wildlife haven. Anyone who's ever listened to Desert Island Discs will surely have asked themselves what their own special recordings and luxury item would be. And of course, that killer question at the end of every programme. If a freak wave were to wash over your desert island and you could save only one possession, which would it be? Living up a hill, as I do, I'm not too worried about this happening in reality. Still, I can't help but imagine myself making those choices. I'd obviously let the 50 years worth of interesting beach stones fend for themselves, but every room of my home has books in it, and I'd twitch terribly at the thought of having to choose just a handful to save them from the rising waves. Would it be my father's old three-volume set of The Lord of the Rings? Or maybe my treasured shorter Oxford English Dictionary? Actually, probably not that, as despite its name, it is the largest book I own. Or what about clothes? On reflection, it would probably be a mercy if most of my tatty wardrobe sank beneath the water. But there are those who collect hats and shoes, like I collect original new naturalist volumes. In parts of England at the moment, the wettest February on record has forced many householders to play this parlour game for real. Rising flood waters mean abandoned homes, farms and businesses, with scant moments for occupiers to save what they can. Here on the island, the few rivers we have wind their short and well-behaved courses to the sea. Flooding more often comes from the seas and not the overflowing river banks. But unlucky basement dwellers in the Strand in Ryde will attest that catastrophic flooding of homes can and does happen here. This year, despite high tides, storms and biblical quantities of rain, they have been spared. A bit of luck? Far from it. Millions of pounds have been spent by Southern Water and the Environment Agency, building a colossal underground storage system for wastewater and rerouting Moncton Mead Brook. Almost all of this work is hidden beneath the ground, and the charming Georgian facade of houses on the Strand are undisturbed by the modern technology that keeps them from being inundated. The one exception is Simeon Street right, wreck, which was repurposed as a place for flood water to be kept 
by the construction of a massive and brutal-looking concrete wall around it. An uglier way to compromise this local green space could hardly have been imagined. What a shame we couldn't re-engineer this whole rather featureless field and let the poor channeled Moncton Mead Brook back out to create an active wetland with new planting, a new landscape, and exciting and interesting places to play, while still keeping a big barrier at the back to stop the houses from being, being flooded. And now we move on to what's on. And the first what's on is Wolverton Manor Garden Fate, a date for your diary. Organisers of the Wolverhampton, uh, Wolverton Manor Garden Fete plan to celebrate the 21st event by making it their biggest yet. The Fete, launched in 2000, will take place over the weekend of September the 5th and 6th. Exhibitor bookings have already been snapped up, with all indoor stalls taken and only a few outdoor pitches remaining, more than six months in advance. A spokesperson for the Warburton Fair said, We expect this year's event to be our biggest and most diverse to date. There will be specialist garden nursery stalls, arts and crafts and Elizabethan and reenactions, who will bring everything from music and dance to cooking and crafts into a modern setting. Activities will range from dog shows and poultry exhibits to wood carving, archery, falconry, displays and live music. More than 7,000 people descended on Wolverton Manor last year with £25,000 raised for Age UK, Isle of Wight and other island charities. And this from Island Food and Drink. Free Mother's Day meal offer for mums. Plenty of island pubs can help you treat mum this Mother's Day and there's an extra bonus for the person paying the bill. On Mother's Day, Sunday, March 22nd, mums can eat free after 6pm when four or more people dine from the main menu or Sunday roast specials at the following venues. The Crown Inn in Shorewell, Buggle Inn, Knighton, Sun Inn at Hilverstone, King's Head in Yarmouth, Bugle Inn in Yarmouth, Crab and Lobster at Bembridge, the Corkheads in Sandown. There is something for all members of the family, from traditional pub favourites to healthy options and mouth-watering roasts. And next, Chicago is coming to Ventnor. Ventnor Theatre Group is preparing to razzle-dazzle its audiences with the upcoming show, Chicago. The musical is being staged by the same creative team that put on Cats in 2018 and will be on at Ventnor Winter Gardens in May. Jesse Wren will, plan, will play the famed double murderess and nightclub performer Velma Kelly with Bryony Davis as wannabe star and fellow cell block inmate Rosie Hart. Chicago is a satirical look at fame, justice and the media machine and Ventnor Theatre Group is delighted to bring it to the island for the first time. Set in the Windy City in the 1920s, Chicago is based on real-life murders and follows the story of the two women as they languish in Cook County Jail. When they both acquire the same greedy superstar lawyer, Billy Flynn, played by Steve Jones, tensions come to a head as they vie for the spotlight, battling for the flashbulb of the newspaper reporters. With catchy tunes and timeless songs such as All That Jazz and Cell Block Tango, Chicago is a musical spectator.
with few with four performances between May the 8th to 10th including two matinees the show will feature a live orchestra under the supervision of musical director Donna Brimani supporting a cast of 32 island performers seats selection is available to book go to ventnortheatergroup.co.uk and information on the Isle of Wight Jazz Weekend from the 27th to the 31st of May 2020 will feature Nikki Isles Jazz Orchestra Benny Goodman Quintet Sarah Bowling Quartet Zoe Gilbert Gilby Quintet Tony Kofi of Higgins and Loft It's Trad Dad Derek Nash Quartet, Barnes and Newton, Nigel Price, I W Y J O, and plus Pete Long, Jamie Safir Trio, plus much much more. Tickets on sale at Isle of Wight County Press now, and see the website for all details. Alewhitejazzweekend.co.uk and Newport Minster offers a very warm welcome to all, and has a full program for the uh, beginning of Lent. I'll just read one or two of them. On Wednesday, the 11th, there's a Holy Communion service at 10 a.m. There's something that sounds rather nice on Mothering Sunday, a big distribution of flowers after the 10:30 service, um, and going on a little bit further for the fifth Sunday of Lent, which is uh, the 29th of March. They have the Minster Eucharist in the morning at 10 as usual, and in evening prayer at 6:30. Conference to look at Isle of Wight's changing habitats. This is written by Colin Pope from the Natural History and Archaeological Society. Our wet, stormy winter is one of the extreme weather events which we associate with a warming climate. Warming climate. How is our wildlife coping with extremes of wet, drought, and heat? The mild winter has encouraged some animals to emerge early from hibernation. An effect of high winter rainfall is increased coastal erosion, to which our coastlines are particularly prone. Many rare insects thrive on our south-facing, unstable slopes. The island's special butterfly, the Gran- Glanville fritillary. Is one of these. However, these species require a period of instability, followed by several years of calm, so that the bare slopes can become revegetated. These days, serial landslides can create too unstable conditions to allow time for specialized plants and insects to recover. Elsewhere, specialized plants and insects that thrive on warm, dry, sandy soils are flourishing, and visiting butterflies, moths, and birds from the continent are being seen more frequently. We are fortunate on the island still to have some wonderfully rich areas of countryside for wildlife, but changes in land management, such as a lack of woodland management. And abandonment of non-productive but wildlife-rich grasslands is putting many species at risk. Moreover, a succession of introduced tree diseases, currently ash dieback, is having an effect upon our native trees and the wildlife dependent upon them. The Isle of Wight Natural History and Archaeological Society is arranging a whole-day conference. Looking at how our wildlife and habitats are changing, we are inviting experts, both locally and nationally, to discuss their areas of expertise. Everyone is invited, is welcome to attend. 
It will be held at the Riverside Centre Newport on Saturday, April 4th, and the cost will be £12 to include refreshments. Full details and booking can be found at tinyurl dot com forward slash s x z p s k v and the Medina Theatre have advertised their March program and urge you to book your tickets early. For example. Barbara Dixon with Nick Holland is coming and they say her interpretation of traditional music married with 20th century songs and material from the theatre is renowned and admired. A second one is Go Now, the music of the Moody Blues. Enjoy the music of the Moody Blues in, in the company of a super group of le legendary musicians, singers and songwriters. They're going to be playing your chance to experience impeccable performances of the Moody Blues, including Nights in White Satin, Go Now, Tuesday Afternoon, Legend of a Mind and much else. There also, that is on um, the Moody Blues of the 13th of March. On the 18th of March, you are offered seven drunken nights. Following sold out smash hit tours, Seven Drunken Nights, the story of the Dubliners, returns to theatres with an even bigger production. It's come from the West End and you will be clapping along to the Wild Rover, a Black Velvet Band, the Irish Lover, Molly Malone, Finnegan's Wake, McAlpine's Fusiliers and much more. That's the 18th of March and tickets for that are £22. There's also coming up on the 22nd of March, the Circus of Horrors. This is a new Circus of Horrors show which will be a celebration of 25 years and will include an amazing amalgamation of acts driven by rock and roll soundscape, a show that you will sat on the edge of your seats while not falling off it with laughter. And so that's on the 22nd. And then finally in March is the Cantata Choir are singing the Carmen, Carmen, Carmen Burana, um, a, a very famous piece of music which is absolutely lovely by Carl Orff and that is on on the 28th of March and the tickets for that are £15 and £5 if you're under 18. Textile art workshops at Centre. Children and parents are invited to discover the joy of textile art at free workshops run by Isle of Wight embroiderers in Freshwater. Yarn Art for Families, a series of four workshops, starts at our place, West White Sports and Community Centre, at 3.30pm 3 next Thursday. The sessions, part of a lottery-funded project by Isle of Wight embroiderers, will introduce people of all ages to simple needlework techniques. Colourful panels created will hang afterwards in the ca cafe. Doors open at 3pm where toast and juice are served. To find out more, email sue.lupton at westwhite.org.uk or go to Our Place Freshwater on Facebook. And Hover Travel want your feedback. Hover Travel's user group, known as HUG, H-U-G, has announced two new events for 2020 for April and September. Loretta Lal, Head of Commercial, said, As we continue in our quest to create a user group which represents our customers, accurately, we are exploring additional new ways to engage with our stakeholders. 
For 2020, we are taking the hug on the water with two evening events which will allow customers to ask questions and float new ideas. There are 40 places on each event planned for April the 27th and September the 16th, open to anyone who has a question which will benefit other customers. Questions need to be submitted via Hover Travel's website in advance and answers will be provided during a 20-minute private charter flight. Submit your questions at hovertravel.co.uk forward, sli uh, forward slash ho hover user um, dash group forward slice. <laughs> Inaugural charity ball raises £15,000. White Aid raised a staggering £15,546 <coughs> at a leap year charity ball last Friday, hosted alongside Sunrise Vectis Rotary and which featured a Rob Dabank DJ set. Held at Northwood House, the inaugural event attracted 140 revellers. They were treated to a performance from harpist Indie Box and classical guitarist Ewan Pope, while island magician Huxley Hunt provided table magic while gusts tucked into a three-course meal provided by Oasis Catering. An auction followed with prizes including a piano cruise, a sailing trip for eight on the Challenger racing boat, and two tickets to visit Premier League Leicester City. Rob DeBank got the guests active with his DJ set before placing a bet of two, a bet or two, or two at the casino, complete with a blackjack table and roulette, the night's biggest winner taking home a bottle of bubbly. Whitehead chairman Jeff Underwood said, such a great evening. Everyone had a great time and we raised a lot of money, which will go to our wonderful small local charities. If you have a pass passion for the island, help White Aid to help those in need on the island by joining. And now on the water. With Storm George putting paid to any racing on Saturday, it was fortunate conditions were considerably friendlier for the Flying Dutchman trophy races on Sunday. Four races were managed, the biggest being against the tide in Bembridge Harbour. The first race got away to a clean start in about 15 knots and bright sunshine. Bruce Huber's green spinnaker was the four first to fly on the run back to the leeward gate, with Mark Downer's white one not far behind and David Peerless third, and that was exactly how it finished, in a 22-knot squall. The breeze dropped for the second race. Downer, first around the windward marks with Huber hot on his heels, extended his lead to win comfortably. The course was tweaked slightly for the third race to cater for a 15 to 20 knot breeze and after another clean start, Downer and Huber played cat and mouse and were never far apart until Downer held on to a strong gust and submarined his way into a narrow lead that he extended on the second round. In the final race, which began in 22 knot winds, rising to 25 knots, it was again dominated by Downer and Huber, with the latter taking line honours by a few boats' length, and this year's Flying Dutchman trophy. And more water sport. Cayley and Carter among the medals, with indoor rowing. Shanklin Sandown Rowing Club were well represented at the National Junior Indoor Rowing Championships held at the Copper Box at London's Olympic Park. Carter Horrocks secured the bronze medal in the Year 7 Boys Race, a superb achievement in only his second national event 
among a field of over 140 competitors. Kayleigh Batchelor followed up her gold medal winning performance at the British Championships by again securing top spot in the Year 9 Girls event. Meanwhile, Rachel Debenham finished in fifth, her highest placed finish in an indoor competition, while Sophie Atkin, Lottie Tapsell and Riley Horrocks were top 10 finishers in their events. Beth Katirua and Abby Swinsco competed for Shanklin for the first time, with both finishing in the top 20. Alana Dennis, Esme Walters, Owen Dennis and Ethan Walters all produced personal best distances. And with that, we complete the readings from the County Press and I wish that the weather will be a little bit better. It's lovely at the moment. And best wishes to you all from Imelda. And from Sonara. Good evening. Tonight, the blind stand-up artist who doesn't believe in leaving his audience wondering. Good evening. I am a blind comedian. Brace yourself for dark humour. <laughs> so, just how high can comedian David Eagle fly? And the Radio 4 series just made for the listeners of this programme. We want to know what you think of the place of touch in society today. Do you hug your friends? Or are we in the midst of a crisis of touch, isolated by technology and afraid of getting things wrong? So, the programme that often follows this one on air, All in the Mind, has made something of a feature of major surveys which dig into our psyches and take a snapshot of Britain's behaviour and state of mind. The latest one looks at our relationship with touch and presenter Claudia Hammond has been telling me more about its aims and why they welcome blind listeners' contributions. So the touch test follows up on two big studies like this we've done before. We did one on loneliness and we did one on rest. And we just thought this feels like a very good time to look at the topic of touch. It's something we've heard about a lot in the wake of Me Too and people talking about inappropriate touch. But also that with new technology, is it the case that some people are becoming perhaps more isolated by touch? We wanted to do something really big with the help of the listeners to find out what's happening now. So there is that one sense that perhaps people are touched too much and inappropriately, but perhaps a, a counter to that, the idea that some people are, are not being touched enough. That's right. And so we asked people all sorts of questions about do they feel a lack of touch in their lives or do they feel too much touch in their lives? What sorts of touch do they think is appropriate in different situations? Would they, you know, hug people goodbye, shake their hands? What is it that they want to do? And then we'll be able to look and see, you know, do attitudes towards touch vary according to perhaps how old people are or by gender or by how attached they feel to to other people. And we're going to look as well at how touch relates to health and to well-being and whether people are happy about being touched by specific professionals as well. So sometimes people say that they think they don't get physically examined, say, so much at the doctors these days. Is that the case? Is it that people would like that to happen more or or less? Now, and just explain what steps you've taken this time to, to make it possible for visually impaired people to fill in the test independently, because it is quite intimate in places, isn't it? It is. And so we didn't want to have a situation where somebody else reads out, say, questions to you. We wanted people to be able to fill it in all on their own because it is all anonymous and confidential. And we want people to be able to be as, as honest as possible. What we did last time was to develop a version that works using a screen reader. But that was after people had requested that. So this time we thought we will learn from that and we will do it all in advance and test it in advance, get people to test it to check that it works. Well, let's see how successful you've been, because someone who has filled it in using a screen reader and I think testing it out is student Olivia Wilson who joins us from Worcester. So first of all Olivia how did you find the form the test to fill in? Really um, accessible like um, every question um, is really easy to tell what, what question it is and what the answers are. Any suggestions as to how it could be improved how it might be done differently? The actual test is really um, accessible the, the the results like access, accessing the results was a bit, was a bit trickier. Like I think there was a um, a graph, which 
I couldn't read. Yes, yeah, so what we've done is we changed that after feedback from Olivia before the proper launch. We changed that so that people don't get a graph that they can't see now. So what about the content, Olivia? I mean, what is your attitude to touching and being touched? I like um, friendly touch, so like being touched by friends. I don't think as a um, society that we're touched enough or that touch is seen as something helpful. Like, for example, I also have a stammer and um, being touched by my friends helps, like, helps with that, like, reduces it. Of course, for visually impaired people, there is bound to be quite a lot of touching. And this is the bit that I found hardest to fill in, that the fact that we get touched by strangers because uh, usually they're trying to help but the problem is of course uh, when you're asked a question about being touched by strangers so much depends on the attitude of the stranger and the way the touch is delivered yeah definitely because it, it's all cont- contextual and sometimes like I'll, I'll be walking somewhere and I'll, I'll ask someone if I can hold their arm but before I've managed to ask them, they've already taken mine. Did filling in the form give you any surprises about yourself, about about your attitudes to touch when you were asked the question kind of straight out? I didn't realise how much I liked being touched by someone that I know. Like that, that was quite surprising. Let me finally go back to Claudia. What's going to happen to all this material? What's it? What's it going to be used for? So the study will be open for another few weeks and then after that, over the next few months, the uh, psychologists from Goldsmiths will be analysing it and we will be announcing the results on Radio 4 in the autumn and and having a big series on touch on all sorts of these different aspects of touch. And then what the researchers are hoping is that maybe from these results they can try to work out what interventions might work, what what things might help, perhaps in all circumstances, to ask permission before they touch people. And so we'll be finding out, you know, how have attitudes changed and if so, how and what's the next step from that for society? Claudia Hammond and we also heard Olivia Wilson. You can find a link to www.touchtest.com on our website. And while we're on the subject of accessible technology, a listener has contacted us with largely favourable comments about the apps of the online taxi service Uber as being a really helpful way for blind people to be able to summon a cab when out on the street, but regretting that the app of one of its rivals, Bolt, which only operates in the UK and London at the moment, doesn't appear to have labelled fields and buttons so that it can be used by a blind person using a screen reader. Well, we've got in touch with Bolt ourselves, and they've held up their hands and said they will now try to correct this gap in their service. Well, we'll keep across what progress they make, but we wondered what other advice there was for people who hear of an app everyone else is raving about, only to discover it can't be used by blind people. I spoke to assistive technology expert Dave Williams, and I asked him whether, other than by contacting in touch, what advice he'd give to frustrated visually impaired app users. Firstly, to say it's not just you. Lots of blind and partially sighted people are using these apps. So you should certainly contact other blind and partially sighted people to find out, is this app generally inaccessible or is it a problem on your device? Is it a problem with a specific version? These things are a moving target, so it's important to check. You can also look online. There are many organisations that post uh, app reviews and so on to find out if anybody else is experiencing the problem. If the app is on the Apple platform, for example, you can go to appleviz.com and that's where lots of blind and partially sighted people post post reviews of apps from an accessibility perspective. And then, of course, you can contact the app developer. And often app developers are soliciting reviews. They want you to post comments on the App Store. So if you write on there, this app is not accessible with the screen reader uh, and explain the steps that you took to try and make it fail and what happened and what you expected to happen, uh, app developers quite often do take those uh, comments very seriously. So you do think the consumer has got some power in this situation? 
I think we've got more power than we realise sometimes because, you know, if an app has received a very small number of reviews and you post yours and you tell the app developer that actually something isn't quite right and that it's really important that they address it, then your voice is not only be heard by the app developer but also seen by other people who are reading the uh, the comments and reviews. So make some noise, talk to other blind and partially sighted people and, and also I think make sure that you're not just missing something. Sometimes I hear about something that's inaccessible and actually it turns out that it might be that you just press a key or you perform a certain gesture and all becomes clear. So a couple of things people can try there. But in this case, Bolt have acknowledged that they've not really done it. What would you say to companies who say they want to be accessible but aren't sure how to go about it? I mean, how difficult is it to make your app accessible for visually impaired people? Well, the most important thing is to ensure that all your controls are labelled in a meaningful way. So if you've got buttons within the app, if you can put a label in there that's uh, discoverable, then that helps a lot. There are guidelines, lots of organisations publishing guidelines for accessible app design. And if you think about this stuff, the sooner the better. Actually, it's much harder to retrofit accessibility later on. And if you make your app easier to use for blind and partially sighted people, the chances are it will be easier for everybody. And what responsibility does the law put on developers? Well it's my understanding that if you are providing a product or a service to the public then you are required to make reasonable adjustments and it's not just the legal argument there's a business case there as well that actually you potentially attract more customers and it's just the right thing to do. Dave Williams. Now blind stand-up artist David Eagle has just been named Best Newcomer by the Influential Chortle Awards. It's only the latest recognition of a rising star. If you know your folk music, you might recognise Dave as a member of the folk band The Young'uns. And they've also won a lot of awards. So what's been David's route from folk to stand-up? Well, it's a similar story, really, I suppose, to people like Billy Connolly, who started out uh, in a folk band, and uh, and then the talking got more and more to the, the detriment of their bandmates, who were kind of thinking, well, can, are we ever going to get a song in here? You know, they sort of just stood there, poised with their with their instruments, kind of getting sore shoulders, just thinking, will you, will you hurry up and finish? And so, uh, for the good of them, really, I thought, well, I better branch out into stand-up and try and uh, sort of deal with those demons, you know, sort of the uh, that that side of it, and also people in the audience uh, gigs would say, "Oh, you know, you should try doing stand up because I would be telling stories on stage." So I did. I took the uh, the leap of faith and and went solo, and it's uh, quite daunting because it means that if something's going really well and you're on stage with a band, it means you can ride on that uh, wave of brilliance and go one, two, three, four, and start the next song and dine out on that great joke for the next three and a half minutes. But uh, and if it doesn't go very well, you can go one, two, three, four, and get out of it. Well, try doing that when you're just on stage by yourself and everyone goes why is he suddenly counting so as a blind stand-up how do you judge the mood of an audience when you you go out on stage or when the curtain comes up or whatever well i suppose it's quite egalitarian in that way because a lot of comedians actually say who, who can see say well you, you can't really see the audience that much i might be able to see the front row of the audience so we're all going on that very visceral response of the laughter so once you're tuned into that and you know i often get asked in the street by people or when i'm on a bus or whatever do you have superpowers as your hearing heightened and I'm sure you get that as well yeah, and um, and I don't think the answer to that really is yes I think it's you, you you learn to tap into that sense more and so I think actually in some ways that maybe is an advantage because I'm sort of listening to the audience and that's my barometer. Now that clip we played it hits your blindness head on I just wonder how much do you use your blindness as a prop? Well this is an interesting thing uh, Peter that I when I started doing comedy the one thing that I didn't want to talk about was blindness I thought it's a bit of an obvious thing. People will see that I'm blind and I get on stage and they'll think, he's going to talk about it. I don't want to do it. It was too obvious. But then the first thing I did, I had all these ideas of other things that I might want to talk about. And then the first thing that happened at my very first stand-up gig is I walked onto the stage, crashed into the microphone stand, <laughs> sent it flying, the microphone cable got caught around my ankles and I was I was lying on my back. And I thought in that moment as I was trying to get up on, onto the uh, on, uh, you know onto the, the stage, I, I thought, I'm going to have to talk about the blindness now, aren't I? So what happened was I ended up addressing that subject and then jokes came from that and then I thought oh that's going down really well so uh, I kind of added that into my set and so inadvertently I've started talking about blindness a lot more 
But I think in some ways, why not? You know, it's who I am and it's a part of me and it's not all I talk about, but it's an important subject. And I think once you address it as well, people go, oh, it's a safe subject to talk about. And I think it's cathartic for, for me and for them. But, I mean, it's, some blind people are quite uncomfortable with that approach, uh, you know, making jokes about your blindness, the self-deprecating joke, if you like. People argue it's apologetic. I think it's empowering. I think if you feel like you have to do it, I think if you feel like you're typecast, then may, yes, I think it is. It can be apologetic. But I don't feel that's not all I talk about. I often start now by talking about the blindness because I've learned from experience if I don't talk about it, I can hear people in the audience mutter into themselves wondering whether I am blind or not. And that puts me off because obviously with my super hearing ability that I apparently have, of course. I can hear all of that. And also I know from experience that people Google it. If I don't talk about the blindness, I'll go get home and I'll have a notification from Google saying that 10 people have googled david eagle blind or david eagle disability or my personal favorite what's wrong with david eagle <laughs> so i might as well address it and then i can get away with it but i think there's so many interesting avenues to explore and it's a it's a different thing that other comedians don't have and so why not talk about it and also if that can empower other people if it can remove the barrier as well i think people see a, a blind person and they go oh maybe i shouldn't say that maybe i shouldn't do that joke maybe i shouldn't talk to them about that and if you can just show people, and this is the brilliant thing about the amount of disabled comedians who are now in mainstream on the TV or on the radio, it normalises it and it stops it becoming a taboo subject, and I think that's brilliant and important. Actually, I've just I've just listened to, because obviously you you tried some stand-up, um, which... <laughs> ah. I was I was wondering whether I dared mention that, but well, it's very I, kind of you to mention I it feel I, I feel I have to mention it, because I've I've had a rather harrowing experience. I had only heard that. This is the first time I've heard it, and it was 15 minutes ago, and I remembered that you did it for Comic Relief. I nearly had a heart attack because you open with a routine about writing Braille on your hand. You say a lot of comedians write their jokes on their hands so they remember them. Well, I can't do that because I read Braille, and you do have a whole routine about that. And the problem is... Oh, you haven't I haven't heard I, that. I think I said something about uh, the trouble was I nearly bled to death or yeah. something like that. <laughs> now, I haven't heard that routine before, but I have. I do exactly the same thing. And so I've just, I suddenly thought, my goodness, he's going to think, if he's heard me on YouTube or if he's going to think I'm ripping him off, but I've never heard the routine. I and it's just obviously, the, the surrender. I suddenly thought, am I being interviewed for In Touch or am I being investigated for you and yours, you know? <laughs> <laughs> do you ever worry that, you know, when you're getting a laugh on stage, you're getting a sympathy vote from the audience rather than a laugh. I've been at open mic nights and other nights where other blind comedians have come on. Well, unfortunately, I've seen them do very bad. Their jokes have been kind of like, oh, I didn't see that one come in, or, or you didn't see what I did there. Mm. So I've seen it not work. I've seen it where you can engender sympathy, I think, for 20, 30 seconds, and then you can tell when the laughter is awkward. You can tell when it isn't working. And I must say, I really enjoyed your your stand-up thing. Once I'd recovered from the shock of having accidentally ripped you off. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a major influence on you, Com a comedic influence? I'm influenced by all sorts of uh, different types of comedy, so there isn't really a firm influence. No, no, I don't. I'm trying to think. I've just got there's so many. I absolutely love comedy from kind of the bottom rung upwards, really. You can learn so much from listening to other people. And so, yeah, I, I absolutely love... I love the sort of surreal aspect that you can go to. I love the, you know, being able to observe something that everyone should have thought of, but nobody else has thought of, and you're the first person to do that, and everyone suddenly goes, why didn't I think of that? It's so obvious, but it's so clever. I love all the facets of comedy. I just think it's, it's wonderful. Just uh, one final thing. We're hmm. always looking for trends on this programme in terms of, of visual bit, impairment. You, yeah. know, you, you suddenly see things. I just wondered if you're doing that in comedy is there anything at the moment that you think this is really the trendy thing this is what is happening now well i think what's fascinating for people and this is why i now don't avoid talking about blindness because i think people are interested in how does he do x y and z how do they do things so you talk about the different technologies that are there how do they you know talk about audio description talk about all these things that people aren't aware of and then you, because it's the questions that people ask it's like oh how do you get around how do you watch tv TV. Am I even allowed to say I watch TV? You start addressing these subjects. It can also be, it can be really funny, hopefully, but it also can be informative. Obviously, my primary objective is to make people laugh, but if I can do some sort of social duty in the interim period, then so be it. So I think that's it, really. It's kind of like, I think actually talking about blindness is a chance to educate people as well as to hopefully make them laugh. David Eagle, and if you happen to be in Glasgow on the 15th of this month, that's Sunday week, David Eagle's on at the Glasgow Comedy Festival. 
We welcome your comments. Of course, you can leave your voice messages on 0161 836 1338. You can email in touch at bbc.co.uk or go to our website where you can download tonight's and previous editions of the programme. That's it from me, Peter White, producer Louise Clark Robotham, and the team. Goodbye. Scaffolding news for Friday, the 6th of March. The list of known footway obstructions for works including scaffolding, hoarding, also details of skips, cranes and cherry pickers. We are unable to include end dates as many are extended on a week by week basis. In the West White, scaffolding at Tanners, 10 High Street, Yarmouth. In Cows and East Cows, scaffolding at Cameos, 16 Bath Road, Cows. 116B High Street Cows, 21 York Street Cows, 24 Castle Street East Cows, 128 Park Road Cows, 16 Birmingham Road Cows and 14 Clarence Road East Cows and skips at 31 Tennyson Road Cows. And in the Ventnor area, scaffolding at Highlands, Bellevue Road, Ventnor, Old Town Hall, 1 to 12 Albert Street, Ventnor, Yeoman's Cottage, High Street, God's Hill, Lawson's Coach House, Pound Lane, Ventnor, and at Blythe Cottage, Blythe Shoot, Chale. There's hoarding at Roxall Primary School, that's at Station Road, Roxall. In the Ride Seaview, Bembridge area, scaffolding, flats 31 to 36, Merrymead Close Ride, 9 Winton Street Ride, Coburg's Union Street Ride, 59 Union Street Ride, Rock Lift Circular Road Seaview, 5 High Street Bembridge and 1 Colonnade Lynn Street Ride and there are skips at 11 Horriston Drive Nettleston and High Saw Turns Off Ride Road Seaview. And in the Newport area, scaffolding at Phones for You, 50 High Street Newport, 146 High Street Newport, 86A Bernard Shoes, St James Street, Newport, 2E Travel Agents, 100 High Street, Newport, and McDonald's, St James Street, Newport. And there's a cherry picker at the rear of 14 Waterford Road, Calborn Road, Newport. In Sandown, there's scaffolding at 95 to 97 High Street, Sandown. Culver Parade Esplanade Sandown and 95 to 97 High Street Shanklin, 55 High Street Sandown, Barnaby's Cafe, 4 Pier Street Sandown, and hoardings at Premier Inn, 1 to 9 Esplanade Sandown, and 89 Downsview Road Sandown, and a crane at Premier Inn, 1 to 9, Esplanade Sandown.